Good morning. The Lord be with you. So, welcome to Sunday morning worship. I'm uh, intern Maddie, um, and we want to extend a thank you and welcome to Pastor Steve Erickson, who will be presiding today. And we also want to welcome and thank Lisa Shimmons for being our guest musician today. So, welcome to Zion. A couple of things, um, and I'll welcome also to our online community. Uh, we are. Uh, we, are, have, we have communion today, and if you haven't picked up your communion wafers, they're in the back. Um, and we ask that after worship, if you could discard, uh, discard all remains of the communion into the two little baskets that are back there in the center pews. Uh, we are also doing virtual communion as well, so if you are at home, feel free to grab anything uh, to represent the elements today. A couple of other things to note, also offering is in the back as well in that box over there. Uh, so the, those are all the housekeeping things I've got. A couple of, thing, a couple of announcements regarding funerals this month. Uh, Arnie Swenson's funeral is on uh, July 15th from 2 to 3 p.m. is the visitation and 3 p.m. is the funeral. Pastor uh, Bittner will be leading the service, and it's at Fitzgerald's. Uh, the other thing is arrangements have been made for Joan Lindstrom's funeral. Uh, there will be an email regarding uh, those arrangements this week, but I can tell you that uh, 9 a.m. will be a visitation here at Zion Lutheran. Uh, from 10 to 11 a.m. will be a funeral, or I'm sorry, a memorial. Uh, she has been cremated. And then uh, there will be a graveside after the funeral at Scandinavian, and then a meal afterwards at Stockholm Inn. So that will be July 29th. Um, so that is, uh, Joan Lindstrom was the daughter of Milton and Virginia Lindstrom, and she passed away uh, June 26th, a couple of weeks back. And so those are the arrangements that we have thus far for um, both, uh, both services. We're also still looking for uh, anyone who would like to help set up communion in the morning um, if we want to do communion at the rails again. Uh, so I just wanted to just throw that back out there. Uh, if there's anyone interested in coming uh, before the service to help set that up, uh, we would like volunteers if uh, we want to do communion at the rails. Um, so welcome to worship. So glad you're here. Thank you, intern Maddie. I'll get my microphone on. I told myself I had to do that before I stood up, and sure enough, I forgot. Just a word, this has been a difficult week here in Northern Illinois with the uh, shootings in Highland Park, uh, Illinois. We've heard it over and over again on the news and read about it in the newspapers. Uh, I actually spent the first two years of my life in Highland Park. Uh, my dad was a teacher down in Glencoe, and mom and dad rented the upstairs of a house in Highland Park. Uh, we moved to Deerfield when they found a rental place they could afford. Dad was earning $3,000 a year uh, at that point back in the early 50s. And uh, we used to go back over to Highland Park for uh, doctor's visits and for various shopping uh, that needed to be done. I took swimming lessons at the high school uh, in Highland Park. Um, we used to go down to the beach, Lake Michigan, to do our swimming, the neighborhood kids. Uh, so it's a place that's uh, very dear uh, to me and, and brought back lots of memories of people and places this last week. We'll remember those folks in our prayers today. We begin with the confession and forgiveness. I'll invite you to stand at this time, if you would. Thank you. 
The Lord be with you. Our first reading for this Sunday, the fifth after Pentecost, is from Deuteronomy chapter 30. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all your undertakings, in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your soil. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you, just as he delighted in prospering your ancestors. When you obey the Lord your God by observing his commandments and decrees, 
that are written in this book of the law, because you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Surely, this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it. No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. Word of God. Let's read the 25th Psalm responsively. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Rather, let those be put to shame who are treacherous. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. In you have I trusted all the day long. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your steadfast love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. You lead the lowly in justice and teach the lowly your way. The second reading, the epistle, is from Colossians, the first chapter. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learned from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. Word of God.
Our gospel reading is from Luke 10. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near to him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him, then he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay with whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The gospel of our Lord. What makes a good Samaritan? This parable is so well known as the title of the Good Samaritan. There are laws with that name, hospitals with that name, and it is used as a common phrase in our language. That was a Good Samaritan. Oh, a Good Samaritan has helped me out. What makes a Good Samaritan? All of us are good, and all of us are not so good, part of being human beings. And we grow up with this neighbor thing, like a good neighbor. Yes. We want to be that good person, be the hero. Be the person that will help the person on the side of the road, help pay for the bills, or help in any way we can. We are told this. We are taught this. Do good. They know we are Christians by our love. But there's a little bit something else to recognize that's at play here. America knows the history of the Civil Rights Movement. The marches, the songs, the resilience, the speeches, the I have a dream, the victory of the Civil Rights Act that desegregated the South and the North, and the Voter Rights Act that restored voting rights to African Americans. But on our way back from the civil rights trip, when we were almost in Nashville to stay the night, we had about 10 youth on the trip with us, and At this point, they're all almost young adults. And are on our way back from, I think we were coming back from Birmingham, and on our way back, they wanted, we we wanted to have a facilitated conversation that was led by the youth. And so the youth would pose the questions and then have everyone else on the bus talk amongst themselves. And then the youth would answer their question and share their experiences and their reflections. We had a bunch of pre-written questions. They had some really good ones. And by the time we got the whole conversation rolling and we were crawling up to Nashville, I went to the back of the bus and asked if there was a final question. And there were two suggestions from two of the youth that ended up being close to the same question. 
getting to the heart of the same thing. If you were there, if you were watching the tear gas, hearing the slurs, being in the fray and the chaos, would you have continued to march? Would you have joined the march? Or would you just have stayed a bystander and watch it? Or would you have walked away? Right now, I can't remember verbatim of what they asked, but this was the general question. What would we do? And I've been thinking about it for the last couple of weeks. I didn't grow up in the 1960s. I learned about the marches, the songs, and the protests, and the victories from textbooks. So I asked myself, what would have I done if I lived in the 1960s? All of us react differently to situations, and that's not a bad thing. But we can be trapped in when we talk more than how we act, or when we stay silent, or say it under our breath so no one else can hear. And I have kind of likened it to how it is when the priest and the Levite looks down at the man on the road and goes to the other side and walks on. How many of us have watched others walk by us when we are lying on the side of the road? How many of us rush to help at the first sign of trouble? And how many of us have looked the other way before and walked on the other side? You see, it's easy to get caught up in what's good and what's bad, and it's also to get, get caught up in the bystander effect. That's human psychology, that's sociology. It's fight, flight, or freeze. But Jesus is fully aware of that. No matter what choices we make, Jesus knows that we may do good at one point, but then keep on walking and passing someone else later on. We do that. This man is left on the side of the road is most likely a Judean. He's coming from Jerusalem to Jericho when he's jumped by bandits, robbed and left for dead. A priest comes by, looks down, and walks, one, walks the other side of the road, and so does a Levite. Two people that know the Torah and recognize what is asked of them, just like how the Pharisees know the Torah. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's Deuteronomy. That's the Torah. That's in the Torah. The priest and the Levite know what's asked of them, but they go on the other side and walks on. Maybe the priest felt like their job was done for the day, or the Levite assumed the man was dead already. And then a Samaritan comes along. There is a reason why Jesus names the Samaritan and not just some guy who comes to help. Names it, a Samaritan comes by. Jesus is intentional in naming the ethnicity of this neighbor. Samaritans are considered, were considered inferior to Judeans and a lot of other uh, people. They were considered impure, so much that anyone who traveled to Samaria would have to shake the dust off when they leave because they don't want to walk around with tainted ground on the soles of their feet. Samaria was often not considered part of Israel, even though they descended from one of the 12 tribes of Israel, just like the Judeans the Galileans, the Levites. They weren't from the same kingdoms, and they had a long line of rivalry. Both sides did. And so, therefore, there was also, from what I've read, that some people, in order to go from Jerusalem to Jericho or from Galilee to Jerusalem, you have to walk through Samaria. Samaria is in the middle. So you got one kingdom here, this... This is where Samaria is. You have to walk through to get to one side or the other. And yeah, some of the roads there were dangerous. The, the geography. 
But some people were so afraid to go in through Samaria that they walked on the other side or tried to avoid it. You can't go between Galilee and Jerusalem without going through Samaria. But people still tried. That was the reputation of the Samaritans. Don't go to this neighborhood or you'll get shot. I hear this a lot. I wouldn't want to live in Chicago. I don't want to get shot. When I was in a public high school in Chicago, even my black and Latin classmates joked, oh, we're going to Englewood? Oh, man, we're going to get shot. That was a joke in school. And I did my hospital chaplaincy internship last summer on the west side of Chicago that had in a neighborhood that has a high concentrations of shootings. Yeah, I've seen gunshot wounds rolled into the ER and saw some of the worst things that humanity can do to one another. And walking with the nurses and doctors who have to experience it every day. And I would bike through that same neighborhood next morning to go home, possibly using the same route that a drive-by happened previous evenings. And Highland Park has been on my mind this week as well, as it has been for a lot of us. This one, I bet, felt a little too close to home. I live 20 miles from Highland Park. Go past Skokie, which is a suburb before Highland Park. They both hug the North Shore of Lake Michigan. It's a really good place to get a lake house and it's got really good real estate. It's wealthy, it's flourishing. But it's, uh, and Highland Park is one of the areas with one of the most strictest gun control measures. And there's a, an, a ban on assault weaponry. Yet, seven were shot. And 40, over 40 more were injured on July 4th, last Monday. A musician friend of the family was playing in the parade and was almost a football field away from the carnage. And his family was there, his wife and his two little kids. This isn't dismissing the fact that we need to take precautions. Unfortunately, we have to do that in this world. And I'm sure the man on the side of the road did consider safety as he was going down that road in Samaria, and that anything can jump out of anywhere. Not one specific area is usually, where usually the one place where things happen and some other area is where nothing happens at all. Things can happen anywhere. I grew up in Chicago. I rode the public transportation system every day. In the, in the third largest city in the country, and I've got stories. A lot of my friends have stories. I am a proud Chicagoan. Chicago is my home. Hurt is everywhere. So this goes beyond, oh, I don't want to go to the city, I'm going to get shot. Jesus is going beyond the simple task to help each other out. This is a good story because it has a moral, help each other out. But he's also going straight for the reputations that have been preceded. Samaritans do have a Jewish ancestry, just as the Judeans did. The land that Samaria is on is part of the 12 tribes of Israel. So what is a good Samaritan? I want to circle back to it because there's another question that might come first. Who is our neighbor? The world is changing all the time. Our neighbors next door are probably not the same as they were 20 years ago. My neighborhood changes all the time in Irving Park. It's not as white as it was when I was growing up. It's still pretty white, but the diversity is changing. But I bike to, through another neighborhood called Albany Park in order to go to the Old Town School of Folk Music where my parents worked, where I was employed, and 
where I took classes or went to the Square Roots Folk Festival, which is happening this weekend, where I hung out, I had to bike through Albany Park in order to get to Lincoln Square, the other neighborhood where the Old Town School was. Albany Park is one of the most diverse zip codes in the country. And I loved biking in the evenings when it's night, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night, and you hear reggaeton playing, and you hear what you can smell what was still grilling, and you can hear the chatter, and you can hear different languages other than English. My dad goes to church in Albany Park. So many people from so many different walks of life. Who is my neighbor? It's us, isn't it? Paul, in his letters to, in his uh, letters to the Colossians, Colossians, sorry, <laughs> reminds his audience and reminds us. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I think we've all been transferred into that kingdom, right? This one body of Christ, a Christ that showed mercy to all of us, where all of us have, may have felt like the man left in the ditch or the, where we have all tried to be the Good Samaritan, where we are all the priest and the Levite that walks on the other side of the road. Who is our neighbor? It's that person that lives on the north side of Chicago and that person who lives on the south side of Chicago and the west side. The person that likes the Cubs, unfortunately, and likes the White Sox. The person that likes the Bears, and the person that likes the cheese has, I mean Packers. <laughs> the person from North Rockford and the person from Midtown. From those from Loves Park and McChesney Park to those who come from Black Hawk. The person who grows up with access to everything and the person who has a budget and has to make impossible decisions, rent over food. The person from the wealthiest zip code and the person from the poorest zip codes. From Highland Park to West Garfield Park, Englewood and Austin in Chicago. The person who is white, the person who is black, and the person who is brown. And we have our gay and bisexual and transgender neighbors as well. And the neighbor that doesn't fall into the human gender binary of he and she. And the Buddhists, the atheists, the Muslims, all of us. All lives do matter. But if one life is hurt, if one neighbor is hurt and we keep walking by, all become some. Samaritan lives matter. Judean lives matter. Levite lives matter. So how do, we how do we inherit eternal life? Whether we recognize it or not, we've got eternal life. That's the gift from God. From the one who showed us mercy. And who better to demonstrate that mercy than Jesus Christ, who died on the cross. Christ coming in the form of a Samaritan. Through Jesus Christ, we are part of a kingdom forgiven for all the times we have walked past and rescued from the darkness of when we needed help. All lives inherit eternal life. That's the good news. God's grace, love, and mercy. Go and do likewise, Jesus says. Amen.
Apostles' Creed. One there before our pages are written. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the conscious power, was crucified, and died in his grave. He descended. 
Word of God as Source and Seed, uh, hymn number 506.
cost. 